Willingdon has the joy of participating in God's plan to proclaim and show God's love within our community and around the world. Giving is an act of worship and part of being a disciple of Jesus. Your faithful and generous giving allows Willingdon to have an impact in the lives of many people. We have witnessed people embracing the saving grace of Jesus and are committed to helping them grow in their personal relationship with Christ. We are celebrating God's faithfulness for His provision to carry on His mission through the ministries at Willingdon Church and beyond. Here are some of the highlights from the ministries which have occurred over this past year. Thank you for your faithful giving and being part of our family where everyone is on mission with Jesus. Welcome to our Willingdon online service. Happy third weekend of Advent. May you experience the joy that Jesus brings. I'm reminded of a passage in Luke chapter 2 where the angel says to the shepherds this, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. May you experience the joy that Jesus brings. Special welcome to you if this is your first time watching us online. We would love to know that you've joined us. Could you fill out the Connect card online and then somebody from our church family will get in touch with you. Also, we're a church that loves to pray and believe that God works when we pray. And so if you've got a prayer request or if you've got something that you would love to praise the Lord for, something really exciting that God has done, fill out the prayer form online and we've got a team of people that will pray for it throughout the week. I've got an invitation for you. We would love to have you join us for one of our worship services on Christmas Eve. Bring a friend, bring your family. It's going to be a joy-filled celebration of the birth of Jesus. This year, our Christmas Eve service will be different than other years. It's going to be grander, really celebratory. The Willingdon Orchestra and Worship Band will lead us in some awesome, familiar carols. There will be an artistic feature that will appeal to the whole family. Pastor Ray will bring us into the story of Jesus' birth. It'll be a great way to launch you into the Christmas weekend. So that there is room for everyone to come, we will have four worship services on Christmas Eve, 10 a.m., 2 p.m., 4 p.m., and 6 p.m. There will be space in the sanctuary and the gym for you to worship with us. And like all of our services, we will be following provincial regulations. Masks will be mandatory, and we will fill the sanctuary and gym to a maximum 50% capacity. We're all disappointed that we can't do the outreach production like we had planned, but 
We are pouring our energy and creativity into these worship services on Christmas Eve to make them really a special time. So mark your calendars, invite your friends, and we'll be so happy to worship with you on Christmas Eve. Another quick announcement for you today. On New Year's Eve, there will be a prayer summit. So December 31st, 7 p.m., we would love for you to join us at Willingdon Church or online for a prayer summit where we reflect on this past year and pray for the upcoming year. Speaking of year end, thank you for your faithful giving. As 2021 closes, please remember that in accordance with CRA regulations, Gifts received and or postmarked on or before Friday, December 31st, 2021 will be credited to your account for 2021. Please note that gifts received on or postmarked on or after January 1st, 2022 will be credited to your account for 2022. Our reception will be open December 29, 30, and 31 to receive year-end donations. The building will be closed December 25 through 28 for the holidays. Please visit our website for more information. Speaking of giving, we're gonna pray now for our offering. And if you would like to give online, just click the link on our website to give. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you so much that you are our provider. And we give as an act of worship and as an act of obedience. I pray, Lord, that you would use these gifts for the furtherance of your kingdom here and around the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Here are some verses from Psalm 95 to set the tone of our worship. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Let's sing together. Through the night, shepherd boy, do you hear what I hear? A song, a song, high above the trees, with a voice as big as the sea.
days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah, and he had a wife from the daughter of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. But they had no child because Elizabeth was barren, and both were advanced in years. Now while he was serving as a priest before God when his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense. And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great before the Lord, and he must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. And Zechariah said to the angel, How shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife is advanced in years. And the angel answered him, I am Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God. And I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. And behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day that these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. And the people were waiting for Zechariah, and they were wondering at his delay in the temple. And when he came out, he was unable to speak to them, and they realized that he had seen a vision in the temple. And he kept making signs to them and remained mute. And when his time of service was ended, he went to his home. After these days, his wife Elizabeth conceived, and for five months she kept herself hidden, saying, Thus the Lord has done for me in the days when he looked on me, to take away my reproach among people. Now the time came for Elizabeth to give birth, and she bore a son. And her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown great mercy to her, and they rejoiced with her. On the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child, and they would have called him Zachariah after his father. But his mother answered, No, he shall be called John. And they said to her, None of your relatives is called by this name. And they made signs to his father, inquiring what he wanted him to be called. And he asked for a writing tablet and wrote, His name is John. And they all wondered. And immediately his mouth was open and his tongue loosed, and he spoke, blessing God. And fear came on all the neighbors, and all these things were talked about through all the hill country of Judea. And all who heard them laid them up in their hearts, saying, What then will this child be? For the hand of the Lord was with them. Are you sometimes awed by what you observe in nature? For example, I find the entire salmon life cycle to be so awe-inspiring. After several years of wandering huge distances in the ocean, salmon swim up rivers until they reach the very spawning ground of their original birthplace. So much in the rainforest depends on the timing of their return. Hungry grizzlies, harbor seals, and bald eagles wait anxiously for their annual salmon feast. The salmon that become food probably don't think it is such a great day. But how do the surviving salmon find the precise river or creek where they were born? Sometimes we observe phenomena in nature that just makes us pause. There's a tropical surgeon fish that spawns precisely at the highest tide of the year during a one-hour period. And precisely at that moment, the giant manta rays appear to feed. How do they know when to show up? When we observe the precision timing of these events, the relationship between species and the intricacies of the ecosystem, we consider the design and beauty of creation, and we're led to consider God's sovereign hand in the universe. We worship, and we're led to ask, could it be that God is sovereignly guiding and timing the events of our personal lives? Today, are you waiting for something? And are you trusting God to act in His timing? 
In our passage today, Zechariah the priest, he longs for two things. One, to have a son, and then secondly, for Messiah to come. The son represents for him and his wife Elizabeth the removal of shame, descendants, inheritance. The Messiah represents God's promises fulfilled. In fact, all Jews are longing for Messiah to come. They're waiting for a a spiritual reawakening. They're, They're waiting for the kingdom of God to come. Zechariah and Elizabeth are described as righteous and blameless. In other words, they're a good, faithful, God-fearing couple. But there is one thing that disappoints them. Despite their faithfulness before God, they have not been able to have a son. They're blameless before God, but not blessed by Him, or so it seems. We can feel the tension. They have God's approval, yet their lives are seemingly marked by disapproval. The absence of children was generally seen as public disgrace in Judaism. And apart from God's miraculous intervention, their situation is hopeless. The King James Version reads that they were well stricken in years. We would say they were past their prime. Sometimes we wonder, is there anything we need to do for God's promise to be fulfilled in our lives? We've sought to be faithful, but we're disappointed. Disappointed by our struggle to have children or by our children that stray from a relationship with God or or by a lingering illness or disappointed by our marriage being less than we expected, disappointed by ongoing financial strain, and so on. What should be our perspective when life is less than we expected it to be? In the case of Zechariah and Elizabeth, the problem was not their disobedience. They had prayed for a son. But Elizabeth was barren, and they were aging. Many in their day would have viewed this as a curse. Was this it? Was this scene going to be their story? What was wrong? Nothing. God was preparing to do something special. Elizabeth's barrenness was due to God's sovereign plan. It was a question of God's timing, that's all. Are we so focused on the current scene of our lives that we no longer see the bigger story? In the days of Herod, something happens. Who is Herod? Herod is a Jewish king who rules over Israel for Rome. He's a loyal friend of Caesar Augustus, the emperor. In Israel, he's known for his tyranny. Herod rules firmly and at times ruthlessly. He taxes the Jewish people heavily. He likes to build things with the money of the people, palaces for his comfort, fortresses for his defense, the temple in Jerusalem, but also many pagan temples throughout his domain. Religion is at his service. He uses the Jewish temple and the priesthood for his own purposes. In his later years, Herod, he suffers from paranoia. He murders his favorite wife, several sons and other relatives. He seeks to eliminate anyone who might threaten or undermine his rule. Even on his deathbed, he orders the killing of one of his sons. He calls himself Herod the King, Herod the First, Herod the Great. He's about himself. He's committed to being one at all costs. And it is during his ruthless reign, near the end, around 4 BC, that something apparently insignificant on the grand stage of world history happens. Zechariah is chosen to serve at the altar of incense. He was one of 18,000 priests who served at the temple. They were all there in Jerusalem for Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles. But throughout the rest of the year, they're divided into 24 groups, each group serving in the temple for two one-week periods. Only once in his lifetime would a priest, like Zechariah, receive the special honor of offering incense in the temple as part of the preparation for the sacrificial offering. This year, he receives the honor to offer the incense with the evening sacrifice. It's around 3.30 p.m. in the afternoon. Crowds have gathered to pray for the nation of Israel. As they pray, incense rises from the altar, the incense symbolizing their prayers rising to God. And it is precisely at this moment, while Zechariah is at the altar of incense, as the people outside the holy place pray, at this highest moment in his priestly career, that God speaks. During this moment of corporate prayer, God acts. He reveals himself. God acts in his sovereign timing. 
God knows the grand story He has been writing since the beginning of time. The scene of His answer often comes at a surprising time, in a surprising place, in a surprising way. When Zechariah sees the angel Gabriel beside the altar, the scene troubles him, terrifies him. He's not ready for the scene. Have the scenes of your life in any way surprised you lately? About a month ago, November 4th to be exact, our oldest daughter was in labor, giving birth to her first child in a Toronto hospital. Our whole family anxiously awaited the news. We prayed. Near the end of the afternoon, around 3.30 p.m., Vancouver time, everything went quiet. She was in intense labor. No texts, no FaceTime, no phone calls. What was happening in Toronto? At around 5.30 p.m., PST, the most brilliant double rainbow appeared over the metro Vancouver skies. We encouraged one another with the rainbow's meaning. We sent texts, uh, God is faithful, God keeps His promises, He keeps His word, family. A few minutes later, we received the wonderful news of our second grandson's birth. What's his name, we asked? Noah James. Perfect, of course, Noah. It could only be Noah. Prayers answered. His birth, the double rainbow, and his name will always be engraved in our memories. God does things in his perfect timing, and we were to take note. Now, we do not think that the double rainbow over Metro Vancouver was all about our family. I'm sure God was speaking to many people in different ways, but he did speak to us in a very special way, and we were to take note of the scene, as you are to, to take note when God speaks to you. Let's return to the story of Zechariah. God has heard his prayers. He has heard the prayers of the crowd gathered at the temple for the evening sacrifice. He has heard their prayers for the nation. He has also heard Zechariah's prayers for a son, what he has prayed for probably hundreds of times. And God speaks. The angel has come with good news. God awakens his servants to his story. In this sermon series, we will see God awakening people as he unveils the story of his son's coming to earth. Zechariah, an aging religious leader, was praying in the temple. Mary, a young woman engaged to be married, living in a small town of little repute, was far from the religious center. When God spoke to them, they were troubled, even disturbed. The shepherds were out on the hills near Bethlehem at night, just watching their sheep as shepherds had done for thousands of years. When God spoke to them, they were awestruck and then overwhelmed by what they discovered. Simeon and Anna were in the temple, aging but awake. They were waiting for their Messiah. Did you notice that God speaks to old and young, men and women, religious and maybe not so religious? As this diverse group of people is awakened to the story God is writing, they respond in very different ways. In the end, it changes their lives. How will God speak to you and me this Christmas season? Are we willing to be changed by Him? The Word of God contains power to change our view of God of ourselves and our understanding of the moment we live in. We live in a time of natural disasters, flooding and heat waves and fires, COVID-19 waves and moral bankruptcy. We live in difficult times. Many are exhausted and cynical. Some are despairing. More than ever, we need to hear God's word to us. It will give us understanding, fill our lives with meaning and gift us with hope. And we need to remember that what we live today is a scene, not the whole story. In the case of Zechariah and Elizabeth, they will have a son. Their disappointments will be reversed. They will be filled with joy. And what God will do for Zechariah and Elizabeth will be for the blessing of the Jewish people. In fact, their child will prepare the way for the blessing of the whole world. Zechariah and Elizabeth are to call their son John. When God names a child, it means something special is happening. God has chosen John to serve him. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And then the angel says something shocking in Luke chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. 
And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. Zechariah is left shell-shocked. Why? The angel is speaking to his two deepest longings, to have a son and two for Messiah to come. Could it possibly be true? There has not been a prophetic voice in Israel for 400 years. Listen to the words of the last chapter of the Old Testament given by the Lord to the prophet Malachi. Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes, and he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. Zechariah knows this passage so well. For 400 years, no prophet of God has been raised up. There has been no special revelation from God. And now the angel says that John, his son, will be a prophet great before the Lord. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit, will turn many children of Israel to the Lord their God, and will go before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah. You can imagine Zechariah's simultaneous delight and confusion. The same spirit that was at work in Elijah, now in my son, in the book of Malachi, Elijah stands alongside Moses as the representative of the entire line of Old Testament prophets speaking with one voice about the coming Messiah. Now the angel says to Zechariah that his son will be used by God to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. He will prepare the way for the Messiah. God is on the move. Salvation nears. This is not just about Zechariah's story or Elizabeth's story or John's story. This is God's story. John will call people to repentance and a life conformed to God's ways. Many will return to the Lord. John will witness to Jesus. In fact, as we see in Luke chapter 1 verse 41, he will witness to Jesus before Jesus is born. When Elizabeth receives a visit from Mary, who is pregnant with the baby Jesus, her fetus leaps in her womb. Even before his birth, John was witnessing to Jesus. John John's ministry will signal God's greatest intervention in human history. And when Jesus the Messiah is born, there will be a remnant ready, a group of people that is ready, that God has drawn to himself for his purposes. How does Zechariah respond? The words of the angel Gabriel speak to the most profound hopes and deepest yearnings of Zechariah and every Jew, but it's too good to be true. Zechariah is rattled by Gabriel's message. He struggles with unbelief because both he and his wife are old. He doubts. How shall I know this, he asks. He asks for a sign. It is interesting how we can serve God faithfully and yet struggle with unbelief as we live through the scenes of our lives. We can observe our religious duty, yet doubt. And what does God do? God addresses our unbelief graciously. How does God address Zechariah's doubt? Well, first, the angel Gabriel identifies himself. He says he stands in the presence of God. He has direct access to God and has been sent by God himself with God's message, a message of good news. Second, the sign to be given will be an act of discipline, but also of grace. As a sign, Zechariah will be left deaf and mute for an appointed time. He will not speak words, nor nor will he hear words until the words spoken by Gabriel are fulfilled in their time. How do we know he is not only mute, but also deaf? Well, in verse 62, people communicate with Zechariah making hand gestures. Zechariah will be deaf and mute for a time, but the word will, by God's grace, still be fulfilled in God's sovereign timing. The message to Zechariah and all those around him is that God is sovereignly in control, keeping his word, fulfilling his promises. Under the discipline of the sign, he will learn to trust God's message. The appearance of the angel delays Zechariah's departure from the holy place. The crowds are wondering and waiting. What happened? As per custom, 
They're waiting for the priest to say the ironic blessing over them from Numbers chapter 6. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Zechariah comes out of the holy place in the temple making hand gestures, trying to communicate what he has seen and heard. He cannot pronounce blessing over the people, but the people rightly discern that he has seen a vision. He has been blessed. When his time of service in the temple ends, his week of priestly duty, Zechariah returns home to the hill country of Judah, and Elizabeth conceives, and she hides herself. Perhaps because she is aware of God's calling on her child, maybe she is just pondering how her scene has changed so dramatically. She worships God because God has looked on her with compassion. He has removed her shame and pain. In the grand story of salvation that he is writing, God has seen the personal needs of Elizabeth and Zechariah, heard their prayers, and has acted in response to their heartfelt pleas. God always keeps his promises on time. Scripture reveals that sometimes God answers requests immediately. Sometimes answers are delayed and given in his timing. And sometimes requests are denied for a better way. God always responds to our requests and his answers often go beyond the personal. His responses to our prayers are woven into the grand story he is writing. They are scenes in his story. What are we praying for? Do we see ourselves within the grand story that he is writing? Can we wait for God's timing? Do we trust him? Nine months later, Elizabeth gives birth to her son. Neighbors and relatives celebrate with her. As commanded, on the boy's eighth day, they come together to present the baby boy for circumcision, the sign of God's faithfulness to Israel. It is a moment to remember the walk of faith, this walk of putting one's faith in God's word going all the way back to Abraham. It is also the moment to name him. Everyone expects his name to be Zechariah. Most certainly he'll be named after his father or grandfather. That was the custom. This should be an easy one. Verse 60 we read, But his mother answered, No, he shall be called John. And they said to her, None of your relatives is called by this name. We know how this works. My oldest brother's second name is Abe, named after my father, Abram. My second brother's second name is John, named after my maternal grandfather, John. My first grandson's second name is Samuel, named after his great-grandfather. My second grandson's second name is James, named after his great-grandfather. It's not hard to figure out how the naming of children happens traditionally. What is Elizabeth thinking? Not one relative has the name John. So they turn to Zechariah, who has not heard Elizabeth's strange answer. Remember, he is still deaf and mute. What will he write? Zechariah asks for his iPad. Actually, uh, a wood tablet covered with wax, his wax pad. For Zechariah, there is no need for consulting nameless or family debate. God has chosen his name, and he writes, his name is John. And they all wonder, They're perplexed. What is going on? And immediately, Zechariah's mouth is opened, his tongue loosed. He praises God. He's just happy he can talk. If he was like one of my daughters, there would now be a three-hour monologue streaming from his mouth, everything he had thought and experienced over the last nine months. Zechariah only needs 200 words. At the end of Luke 1, Zechariah, filled with the Holy Spirit, speaks forth a prophetic song, 200 words prophesying the ministry of his son John, preparing the way. In his silence, Zechariah has watched the promise be fulfilled in Elizabeth's womb. He already was a God-fearer when the angel Gabriel appeared. Now he's gone deeper. He has learned to trust God. He joyfully blesses God because the time of the word's, word's fulfillment has come. God's answers elicit joy. They elicit joy. The people around Zechariah and Elizabeth are not only amazed, they have a deep emotional reaction to the news. God is at work and they sense it. Something unusual is happening, something different. And they ask, what then will this child be? They're watching. 
As Zechariah's prophetic song ends, it shifts to Jesus. Verse 78b, where the, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. John's name means God has shown favor or God has been gracious. He witnesses to the one to be born, Jesus. As Paul would later write, Galatians chapter 4, verse 4, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son. Jesus will be born in God's perfect timing. John's life is a scene in the grand story of salvation that God is writing. He points to Jesus. The Old Testament, it ends with these words. This is the last verse of the Old Testament, and he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers. This is referring to John. And then it ends with this, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. A decree of utter destruction. The Old Testament ends with destruction. How does the New Testament end? We go to Revelation chapter 22, verse 21. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with all. Amen. Between that last verse of the Old Testament and the last verse of the New Te Testament, Jesus comes. We now live under the grace of God. Jesus has come, revealing the Father's heart for us. We see God's heart for Zechariah and Elizabeth in the same way that God has a personal interest in Zechariah and Elizabeth. He has a personal interest in us. And he has sent his son for our salvation. May we be awakened to what God is doing this Christmas season. Amen. Let me pray. Father, we thank you that you are at work in our lives. Sometimes we don't see it. We don't see how you're working in our lives. And we doubt. We struggle with unbelief. Oh, Lord, help us in our unbelief. Increase our faith. Help us to see what you're doing. Help us to understand your ways. Lord, fill us with faith. May we grow in our trust in you this Christmas season. Father, I pray for those who are watching. Oh, Lord, may they sense your presence with them. May they surrender their lives to you in this moment, this current scene that they are living. And they, may they trust you not only with this scene, but with the whole story of their lives and the whole story that you are writing in history. We praise you and we thank you. We bless you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless.
Thanks for joining us today. I hope you had a wonderful time worshiping Jesus with us. To close, here are some verses from the book of Jude. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Amen.